Okay, we're here. I think we're here. We're here. It's four o'clock. Um, my name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry. And uh, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My colleague Emily Wicks is hidden behind the scenes in Connecticut. And in California uh, is Scott Shershaw, who's, uh, whose presence here is uh, a, great, uh, a great excitement to us as uh, we got into the, what is it? The summer puppet form, online puppet form number three with Scott, uh, object lessons, material culture and humanistic studies. And this is a part of our summer long series of uh, puppet forums with different scholars and, and puppeteers. In the past two weeks, we've had Paulette Richards and Theodore Skipataris. Next week, we'll have uh, Peter Schumann, director of the Bread and Puppet Theater. And uh, we should post the list. Uh, Claudia Ornstein, Jennifer Goodlander, Penny Francis, Terry Silvio, Steve Tillis, Frank Proshen, Matthew Cohen, Raphael Flori, and Dacia Posner are included in, in the speakers in this series. So, and what we want to do is to think about, in my mind, what puppetry studies is uh, today. I think, I feel like I, that's a term that I invented, or maybe somebody else did, but it's sort of an incohate field of studies, but something that a lot of us puppeteers and people who teach puppetry are thinking about. More and more colleges and universities are including some kind of attention to puppetry performance. And then there's a whole broader field of uh, material culture studies and object-oriented ontology, all sorts of different approaches to the nature of the material world and in performance. Uh, and thinking of puppetry not as a throwback to a primitive pre-modern culture, but as the practical ways that humans have connected with and performed their relationships uh, with each other and, and the material world. So that's my ulterior motive personally in thinking about this. And uh, we're really happy that, that Scott is here because um, his book, uh, Puppets and Popular Culture, which came out in 1995, is, has become a kind of touchstone for a lot of this work. Scott uh, teaches, uh, is a professor of English at the University of California at, at, at Davis. So he's coming at, or has come at, is coming at this subject from of uh, the field of, of, of English literature and, and critical theory, which is super awesome. Helping a little more about Scott. He's the author, as I said, of Puppets in Popular Culture and of other articles and books on theater, popular culture and critical theory. His most recent books include Bread from Bloomsbury's Object Lessons series from 2016 and <clears throat> The Love of Ruins, Letters on Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft from 2017. Uh, he's also the author of books like The Work and the Gift. And um, is, uh, is there a book called Deconstructing Dignity? Am I right about that? Yes, that's okay. right. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's really, uh, I'm enjoying this very much. I was very pleased to be asked. Um, so uh, thanks again. Um, I, was, I was talking with, um, if I'm interrupting you, just let me oh, know, no, no. shake your fist at me. Um, I was talking with Claudia Orenstein who teaches at Hunter College and CUNY Graduate Center and uh, Alyssa Mello and, and um, Cariad Astley's and uh, and Claudia, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, edited this book called Women in Puppetry. And we were talking about the fact that, or she, she was saying nice things about your work. And she was saying, I don't know if Scott knows the place that, that, that um, people who write about puppetry or teach puppetry the, the, the high regard in which we hold your book, um, in part because 
you you're doing other things besides teaching uh, talking about puppetry, which you did so concisely in, in 1995. But I thought I might just start as we discuss your work and uh, puppets in popular culture and what you've been doing now mm -hmm. since then. I thought maybe I'd, I'd take a, a look at the way that your work in, uh, inspired or, or affected um, uh, women in puppetry. This is from the introduction by Alyssa Mello and Claudia Ornstein. And um, we're talking about early modern puppets. So if people in the audience get too geeky, just say you're too geeky on the comments list, uh, the chat box on Facebook Live, because we in encourage interaction. Uh, so they write, Scott Cutler Shershaw argues that at this time, whether as performing object or linguistic trope, the puppet figure embodies a hierarchical vision of authorship and the corresponding social hierarchies of gender and class, and that the figure, the puppet is figurally linked to a range of social and sexual subordination, the woman, the child, the servant, the upstart. And they're quoting from Puppets in Popular Culture. This subordination and diminution of the female is etymologically manifest not only through associations rooted in the originating Latin that blurs the female with dolls and children, because they're talking about words, but also, quote, in, an, in a historical series of hierarchical meanings uh, that evokes, and then there's a block quotation from your book, a descending hierarchy of generation and incarnation, the woman's procreative body, the child that body bears and sustains, the child's plaything, and taking its place at both the top and the bottom of that hierarchy, okay, so to speak, woman conceptualized and reified as herself an object or plaything of male desire, end quote. So that's this something you wrote in, in your book, which isn't particularly focused on um, feminist studies or feminist perspective, but it's proved to be an interesting point that they wanted to, uh, Mello and Ornstein wanted to look at. Um, yes. And I thought that that, maybe that's a way to, to <coughs> excuse me, to get into some of the ideas that you're approaching with puppets in popular culture, which I would say is looking at particular instances, not of puppets themselves, but the way that people wrote about puppetry, the words that people chose, or the ideas that people associated with puppetry from um, like the late medieval period through the Renaissance and into the modern period. Is that, am I on the right track there with what you're doing? Yes, certainly, I think. You know, if, if I were to try to summarize the sort of basic assumption, and the book goes a lot of different places because I look at a lot of different periods up, up to the nearly the present or at least the 20th century, but it, would, it, it has to do with how certain uh, hierarchies, I think in the book I, I refer to them as hierarchies of representation. Uh, you could even use a word like ontology. I don't think I couch it like that, but, you know, sort of ontological uh, hierarchy in a kind of quasi-Platonic way. I mean, Plato was the obvious reference point, but it might not always be a full-fledged uh, Platonic philosophy with really transcendental forms, but, but that it's a hierarchy in which um, truth is seen to get diluted. And again, that's a, the Platonic manner of thinking. Um, and, and so the puppet uh, is always at the bottom of a certain kind of representational hierarchy, uh, both because it's literally almost always small. So it's like a marionette, you know, a little, a little version of a little representation, where it's always to be contrasted to an adult, you know, human <laughs> representation, a real actor. Um, and so th these kind of, as it were, purely abstract, uh, representational hierarchies get, and here, what verb is the right one? It's tricky, get, because it has implications philosophically, but they, I was about to say get overlain with, or that something gets built onto them, or something gets in, somehow wo interwoven with them. You know, it's some, some such verb as that, it's kind of, these are all metaphors, but that, and those would be, I mean, the one that I 
talk about in what you were just quoting would be gender that and that was inevitable to talk about with regard to puppets you were sort of intimating that um, even linguistically where puppet comes from pupa um, and that there's a sort of uh, you know, which again can mean like an embryonic stage it's uh, used in you know for insects um, um, it, and this is in the book, it's, it's too long to summarize, but it gets complexly related to the female body in certain ways. And so just as there are these traditional chains of association, sort of male, the female is subordinate or, and then of course, although I don't really talk about race in the book, but certainly that would be the same black and white uh, with again, black always the, the other of white or dark of light and so forth. So these chains of association that are sort of purely abstract, although, and, and, and it's a hard thing to think about. I mean, are they inevitable or is it just that Western culture through Plato gets written this way? It, th that's a very hard and big question, but, um, but these purely ontological things get overlain with social, cultural, gendered, raced uh, kinds of hierarchies. Uh, th th and that's one of the overall assumptions of the book, I think. Why yeah. did you decide to write about puppets at this time? Like, I don't know what your background is, but I, it, it, when I look at that book and, and think about the way it's connected to liter literary studies or studies of drama, bringing puppets into the into the equation is 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 novel which is one reason why your book is so fascinating why did you write about puppets back in 1995 i think to be honest the book, the book presented itself to me uh, in the form of um these connections that i was just noticed happened to notice so it didn't really come to me with a thesis full blown i actually had been thinking about it and it took me sort of a while to develop the, anything like a thesis but what i just was noted is the the extreme frequency with which puppets are referred to so it was not not so much even puppet theater though of course that has also always existed and when often this is in the context of refer, uh, somebody like a kind of journalist writer SAS noticing some kind of real performance by puppets, but then, but then as an image, I mean, whether it, the one that we all know, like puppet state, where puppet is a metaphor for a certain kind of uh, control from an outside agent, we, you know, it goes into the language like that. And specifically, you know, I think I had written, in, in a way, I had been working on Renaissance literature, and, and maybe that's the heart of the book. There's a, that's a big chapter in it, and I had noticed references to it, Puppets in London, uh, one play where a character says, Motions of Fleet Street, and I had to sort of look up that motions means, oh, puppet shows. Right. Fleet Street's the heart of London. Uh, and then in an utterly unrelated context, for some reason, I may be teaching related, I was reading something about uh, Gordon Craig and thinking mm. about the uber marionette. And, right. that, and then I suddenly thought, God, Ben Johnson was the, is obsessed with, simply obsessed with puppets. Hmm. He, he refers to them again and again, and of course famously has a puppet show play within the play in Bartlemy Fair, mm -hmm. uh, which was irresistible. And so it, it really emerged to me as a web of connections. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, wow, while wow, these 18th century people are all talking about punch and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, sort of like, and it started to emerge like that. Um, and to be, you know, it ended up, I ended up organizing it chronologically in terms of different periods going to the present, but yeah. uh, you could have almost I did con seriously consider doing it in some more conceptual way in terms of the meanings of puppets, but I could never make that <laughs> quite cohere. Um, they're, they're too interrelated and shading into one another. Uh, that's sort of the point, you know, these kind of vaguely sexual, um, vaguely sort of social, uh, social subordination. Uh, it, these associations are, are subtle and, and overlapping all the time, it seems to me. I wonder if we should go into some of the illustrations that we sure. pulled from your book as, as a way to, to talk a little more about the different ways that you're looking at the place of, 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 of puppet theater in, in the Renaissance and, and later, mm -hmm. or in medieval sure. times. Thank you, Emily. There's a nice photo with the, and the Crookshank illustration on the cover. Yeah, I was never sure I was wild about purple and yellow combined. <laughs> no, no disrespect to the designer, but, <laughs> but uh, um, oh, this is the table of contents, which 
I thought was super interesting because it talks about the uh, the the four chapters here and and the, the theological theater in chapter one and uh, chapter two in early modern England chapter three in uh, which is uh, I'm sorry I I'm why don't you explain rather than me talking Scott that yes. might be better. Well, he, everything we're saying was, of course, fine. And so it, uh, the first chapter is a little more theoretical, but I talked there about the oldest material. It actually starts with Plato because Plato, the, the most famous passage in all of Plato, probably the, the allegory of the cave, the, the shadows are being cast. And, you know, it's, if you various translations give it differently and I don't have any ancient Greece, I have to, Greek, I have to, you know, <laughs> uh, just uh, rely on the translators and scholars of Greek, but uh, the word seems to be, it's something theatrical and it does seem to be almost puppet related that in other words, people are carrying objects between, if you know the, the allegory of the cave, the people are looking at the back of the cave and people are carrying around objects. And, and, and it says, he actually says much like, puppeteers do, or some right. word like that, uh, right. exhibitor of shows or exhibitor of something. So it's it, it's a very, very close to an image of puppets if it's not quite literally that. Um, and and uh, and I showed how there's a uh, an overlap, it's really quite fascinating between a whole discourse about idolatry and puppets. Mm -hmm. um, and these odd words, mammoths, um, and marmosets and marionettes. I mean, it, they all have complex uh, etymology. They all mean puppet, although mammoth was a word that originally meant idol, but it, but it gets to be used for, uh, for puppet. And then this complicated Protestant discourse later in which uh, uh, like uh, the pun or near pun of popery and puppetry, because oh. Protestants were saying that the Eucharist is a, a bit of a, like a magic trick. And, or even like a jack in the box, one someone said. So even the idea that the Eucharist could have a presence in it as an object, then right. detractors said, oh, just like a puppet show, saying that, of course, to detract from it. <laughs> um, and then, yes, so we go, I go through more or less uh, uh, history. I think, you know, the, the Renaissance is very interesting. We were just talking about that with, uh, especially with Johnson uh, in, in chapter three. Uh, it, the, the most interesting figures would actually be Henry Fielding, uh, the, the you know famous novelist, but he, who wrote plays first, and in one of them again has a kind of puppet show in it. In fact, there what he does is that the humans and the puppets get mixed up. It's quite kind of amusing. And then mm -hmm. Charlotte Shark, a figure who others have uh, been interested in later, again in terms of the history of women in the theater, a very interesting figure, and she was also a puppeteer. Um, and then, of course, Punch and Judy is sort of the mm -hmm. uh, the culmination of all kinds of developments where Punch was for a long time actually played by actors um, and so forth. But And then the last one about modern puppetry. And, you know, there I was very particularly interested in certain kinds of theatrical avant-garde, mm -hmm. uh, Bauhaus, uh, uh, where puppets I, I'm a little critical about some of it and maybe a way that I might be a little more forgiving today, uh, some of that, but it, it sort of worked in the logic of my argument to see this as sort of a, uh, still a symbol of a certain kind of power, <laughs> you might well, say. Well, how were you critical? Were, were you critical of a more mo modern or contemporary uses of puppetry? Well, I suppose if there's any real criticism in that sense, it would be in the very end. Um, about the Muppets, where I think there, and, and in a way you might say, a certain political um, theme maybe emerges uh, about where I, I, I do sort of, in a way, criticize the, the, the Muppets for a certain kind of ultimate appropriation of, of this folk tradition of puppetry, mm. uh, which now becomes sort of almost fully corporatized and mediaized so that a Muppet it practically means media puppet. I don't know if that was really literally their idea, right. but it might as well have been because that's what the, you know, what they've always been. Well, it's uh, complicated because like with Jim, I think Jim Henson's like brilliance uh, was to understand the medium of, of the camera. And it, in a way it, it, it comments upon the mediated situation we're in now where, 
a lot of us do live puppetry, but especially with COVID, a lot of us have been doing puppetry online. So we're all mm -hmm. using cameras and it complicates the, the, the arrangement, you know, with human puppet, human puppet laptop computer as object. I did. Yeah, yeah. And it, of course it is, it works beautifully on, you know, on the screen. I mean, Muppets attest to that and uh, even on their movies and all that. Um, but there's just something special about the physical puppet. I mean, um, I think when I was just, I was mentioning a web of connections and it was just that I was having the earliest thoughts of this. I happened to see a street performer with a kind of old man puppet and was really good at with it and it was so eerie uh, that there's an eerie there is an eeriness to puppets right. sometimes um uh or i also remember once visiting uh, i don't know if it you would know i'm sure john but uh there was an attempt to have a kind of salzburg type uh, uh, marionette opera uh somewhere in new england i oh. sort of forgetting where there was a new hampshire yeah. opera marionette company in a a puppet house that burned down, but I, and yeah, Frank I, Ballard, our namesake, he was he loved to do marionette operas and and or puppet operas and musicals. Yeah, I just I think it was there. It, it, they I you know they did a kind of abbreviated opera. It was quite beautiful with beautiful marionettes, and they would let you one by one kind of go in backstage at the end. And I just remember seeing you know the female. She was a ballet dancer puppet and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just, it was so lovely. And I, I said something like, oh, aren't you pretty? Or said something like that. And, and the, the puppet curtsied to me. Right. And I, it's still one of the most uncanny moments I, I think I've ever experienced. Yeah. It, it was, it really was when in your presence, particularly marionettes somehow, I think they have a, a, a kind of amazing uh, vitality. Uh, um, yeah, so, uncanny is, it, that always seems to come up with puppets, this, consciousness of it not being alive but then it is alive and yeah i wonder if we should go to the some of the images that from the book and maybe that would help us think about yes yeah what's going on there right this is an amazing image this is of course a detail of a long larger thing that was the front piece of a large book um <clears throat> it's an amazing engraving isn't it i mean it's it's a, it's trying to show the whole universe sort of both symbolically uh in things like the the zodiac plus the idea of the the spheres that you know the, the celestial spheres and all that the relevance to it in the context was that what this would be would be god uh jehovah the hebrew um and this would be nature mother nature the the female figure so nature is connected with a chain to god and and nature herself holds this would be man, humanity, the ape of nature. Mm -hmm. And so it's a remarkable thing about representation, mankind there who is sitting on the globe, but also holding a globe. So there's a sort of this involution. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is partly, I think, uh, you could relate it both very sort of obviously again to Plato, this the idea of representation, you know, descending down to the world. Uh, it's also Aristotle who actually. The, the notion of man as the ape of nature was emerges really more out of the reading of Aristotle, who mm. famously says that human beings are the most imitative of all creatures. So that, mm. so and the ape figure, it's funny. It's here, it's just humanity, and yet it also can be deployed sort of negatively. Um, mm. uh, it, it, how so? That same, oh, sorry, go on. I'm sorry. How how so negatively? Well, I, like I think in some of that discourse. That I was just alluding to against uh, against Catholicism, you might say, oh, the, a, a silly ape, and it, like an, an ape was used as sort of like excessively histrionic, as mm -hmm. it were, um, uh, to, you know, phony. One might almost say, in mm -hmm. a certain sense. Uh, so it gets that meaning mm -hmm. too, a little bit of sort of pejorative one. It's interesting. So, yes, that, picture. It's interesting that like both Plato's sense of the nature of reality uses a puppet metaphor and a hierarchy, right? I, I, and, and then this image uses a kind of puppet metaphor, I think you're saying for another kind of, I think that's a, it's a hierarchical situation. Is, is that correct? Yes, and that's sort of what 
in very broad terms, I try to suggest it, it, the puppet gets inscribed in these hierarchical uh, ways of thinking. I mean, not inevitably, they're not always about puppets, but insofar as people use that metaphor, use the puppet as a, a kind of figure or metaphor, or if they just sort of talk about puppet theater, they sort of tend to inscribe it. And again, that's what I was sort of talking about at the beginning. So the puppet is literally small, so subordinate through just smallness or diminution, uh, uh, inanimate, so lacking life, um, uh, um, an ape in the, or in the sense of uh, counterfeit. Uh, in other words, they seem to be alive, they're not really alive. So they, okay. they get sort of inscribed as the low, uh, the low term, either in an opposition, such as live and alive and dead, uh, or or a certain kind of hierarchy where they're, uh, because uh, the the idea of a theological theater, which titled the first chapter, okay. that was that phrase comes from Derrida, or at least that's where I got it. Where, and Derrida was using that. Um, it, actually, it's in an essay about Artaud. So he was in the process of talking about things that Artaud was trying to break through. But so in summarizing though, the old model, he calls it theological. Where Why is it, it theological? Very, well, it's, it, you can sort of see it, it, it just right there at the metaphor oh. level. You have a playwright who is, so to okay. speak, absent usually. I mean, he might be backstage, but he's not on stage. Uh, and then interpretive slaves, the actors right. who, uh, you know, realize the words, they are, you might say they are the puppets of the okay. author in a certain mm -hmm. figural sense. Uh, and that gets, you know, that gets said all the time. So mm -hmm. um, like Ben Johnson says, actors are uh, puppets that speak from our mouths, mm -hmm. or I think that's Robert Greene, but mm -hmm. in the Renaissance. So, uh, and then if you were to put puppets in, they would have to be even lower. So then it becomes like the platonic thing Mm -hmm. It's not bad. The actor's already a representer, uh, a counterfeiter, but the puppet is then a representation of an actor. So it's a little bit like Plato saying, you know, uh, the, the linguistic sign is three uh, removes from truth. It, it's even worse than just a copy of the truth. Uh, There's a, a comment, question, uh, comment um, from Stefano Brancato, who's a Yukon puppet arts graduate living in New York. Oh, and it makes me think of how we got, we started talking in terms of the situation of women that women in puppetry is quoting, but he says, uh, not much of a question, but more of an observation of how the materials that make up a puppet um, echo subordination in how it relates to sexuality, BD, bondage, sadomasochism, BDSM and bondage specifically. I don't know if you thought about that, Professor. Um, well, I may not know about the bondage <laughs> connection specifically. I, I certainly can see again because that metaphor is so available of the puppet as an object of of uh, manipulation, if you will. I mean, mm -hmm. um, so I could see how, in a certain kind of submissiveness, or sub, you know, that one could mm -hmm. could employ that kind of thinking. You're my puppet. There are pop so songs, although that's usually a man complaining that it woman has deceived him, I'm, I'm your puppet. Isn't there a pop song, old pop song like that? Anyway. There's a couple of them, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I was just thinking maybe this is ancillary, but like puppets in many cultures are very often engaged in performing uh, sexuality, you know, um, in like in Korea and Africa. And I think in many, many cultures is they're they're stooping and stuff. But what, um, uh, so there's, I don't know, that, I, maybe that's an, I don't know how related that is to what we're talking about. Yeah, but certainly, you know, the image, uh, yeah, of like a, a living doll uh, would very, right. could very easily become sexualized. Uh, and even, I suppose, at some level, Pygmalion, a certain, um, not, not overtly sexual, but sort of the idea of remaking a person and who then becomes right. your, uh, your puppet in a certain sense. And the famous graphic of My Fair Lady, which the musical based on Shaw's Pygmalion by, I think it was Hirschfeld, was of Shaw operating the Henry Higgins figure who was operating the, what's her name? The, um, Liza. Uh, the, Liza, thank you. And the, you know, I, I can I, picture that. Yeah, I haven't seen it in years, but I, yeah. 
do puppets resist this uh, hierarchy? We oftentimes we puppeteers think of puppets that romanticize them as you know places of resistance to power. But are puppets? Are, do you feel puppets or did you feel puppets are resisting this hierarchy? They're down there at the bottom with the ape on the thing. How yeah, does that work? I, it's a complicated question and, and my answer needs to be a little complicated. I would say that in the book itself, I'm not that um, open to that reading. I, I, right. I think the, that's sort of what I, what I meant in a way that in a way I think I was under I, I was feeling quite skeptical about a certain argument being made at that time, even though I was being very influenced by what might be called cultural studies, um, and mm -hmm. Stuart Hall, uh, other uh, writers like that at the time. But I think I also had, uh, I, I was a little skeptical about how truly sort of socially or politically uh, redemptive uh, popular culture could be. There, there, mm -hmm. there were a lot of attempts at that time to suggest that it was really a kind of resistant form, it really resisted power, as you as you were suggesting. And I think in the book itself, I'm, I'm that skepticism gets sort of into it. I'm, I'm I mostly think that puppets get re re-enlisted in power. I mean, an example there would be, you know, might be Pinocchio, uh, the original story anyway, the, the actual novel, although I guess in the Disney, you could almost say this too, that in a way it resists in, in one sense, you could sort of say he resists being a puppet and <laughs> famously wants to be a real boy. But it seems to me it just gets sort of re-enlisted in a certain kind of um, almost one might say bourgeois narrative of, of, of uh, social refinement. So what, what Pinocchio learns is to be proper. And, and, and really the book is trying to teach, it was for children always, trying to teach children these moral lessons. Mm. So in a way, I think the resistance gets sort of neutralized. That was another famous argument of the times, you know, uh, uh, in the 90s that one of the other in English studies, a so-called new historicism. And right. one, one of their most famous insights when, when in talking about the Renaissance, and things like Renaissance drama was a tendency that they sort of stage a kind of subversion, mm -hmm. uh, apparent subversion of authority, but always sort of turn it off as well, right? Um, uh, and and re <laughs> reappropriate uh, right. everything, you know, for power. Carnival so, goes back to Lent, so. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's true. And, or, you know, famously, like Peter Stolybrus and Alan White, that's a very well known book, um, who, who argued that, that that sort of carnival culture was really a safety valve allowing mm. society actually to keep things, mm. you know, conservative uh, in a certain way. I wonder if we should go to the next image. Sure. And I, there's a couple of comments. Um, the puppeteer Polysonic writes Tom Jones puppet man so I guess she's referring to fielding Tom Jones I Tom Jones maybe that puppets appear in that and Claudia Orenstein who we mentioned earlier says interesting that you say this example sees puppets as a further platonic imitation in being an imitation of an actor Gordon Craig and others say instead that the puppet is less imitating than and is more being the character without the human problems of the actor. Just an interesting contrast. Yeah, the, the, you know, that's really interesting. I, I think I, I think what I do argue in the book though is that in a way that some of those then modern people sort of heirs of this tradition, they kind of make a, an end, round, end run around it all so that yes, now the puppet, he sort of inverted, you might say, but now suddenly gets like thrown to the top. So it's it's very, all precisely those characteristics that in a more traditional, uh, I don't know if that's the word, an older kind of ontological hierarchy, you know, being inanimate, being merely material, but then that can be turned on their head and say, yes, but for that very reason, they're the perfect uh, vehicle of theater and of art. Um, well, I would only add, though, that particularly say with Craig, uh, his I think his fantasy, and I, I say fantasy because, of course, he didn't do all that much real work, you know, uh, mostly writing, but that w really was of a, it would almost be like a modern uh, automata that I, I guess we we actually have, uh, can, you know, like something that could be wholly controlled. So in a way, it's still a hierarchical thing, or at least 
shall I say, it's still part of the theological theater. It gets because okay. he's still fantasizing about the author controlling, mm. you know, these these puppets. Uh, what are we not, looking at here? Uh, witches receive demonic puppets from Satan. Yeah, this was part of that chapter, briefly summarizing uh, the connections of puppets with idols and 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 with the demonic in certain ways. I just I, when I happen to see this. Uh, actually at this museum in Salem, it, although it's from a book, I couldn't seem to find it anywhere else, but um, the, this, this was a later reproduction of this, but the, right, the, the, the devil who again is black, I mean, yet another, you know, a famous, that, that famous and regrettable association of, uh, in our culture with black, with evil. But uh, so the idea was, witches were the tools of the devil and he sometimes uh, controlled them through something bodily on them there was this, these fantasies that they would grow a, another breast or a teat or something that the devil would suckle but then there was this other fantasy that he controlled them by giving them puppets mm. uh, giving them you know and it, it's all imbricated with you know image magic uh, and the idea that you can hurt someone by putting a pin in there, right. which we associate with, you know, voodoo. Oh, and yeah. actually, there's all these European references to it going way back. Actually, even there's one thing in Plato that I think may be a reference to image magic, although some people think not. But um, so that's a very old tradition. Mm -hmm. Great. I, and sometimes I, I wonder, was, I don't know if this image is from the, the North America or from, from Europe, but. Well, it's from uh, England, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I, I, I always think that the person drawing that might've been exposed to medieval style passion plays or cycle dramas that routinely used masks and devils and, you know, like, I, I wonder, you know, yeah. is this also not just a metaphorical representation, but is, is it connected to some practical practice? But I think absolutely. And there, there are references to automata, religious automata, which right. all get grouped, you know, with, when the Protestants and, you know, Puritan Reformation, they don't like any of it. And so they group them all together. Yeah. But I think the fact that there were there are both myths of, or, you know, uh, stories of, say, a statue of Mary nodding, right. coming to life briefly, but then they do know that there were these auto, like, often maybe like a nativity scene or something, but done with little figures that would actually move, presumably, you know, sure. way, clockwork. Uh, there was one I know I talk about, it's a funny name, where it became known as Jack Snacker of Whittington, because sure. Jack Snacker was a little figure in this much more elaborate tableau but he was somebody who was frightened and he trembled so you have to imagine a kind of little auto trembling automata and he became the famous part of it which always uh, I always found that amusing not not the religious figures but somebody at the margin what what's the next image uh, oh yeah this is one I know we were chatting about I like I've always liked this one so this would now you know 1729 we're in the 18th century and this is a at this moment, what I write about is that there's a very active theatrical tradition in London still, and they certainly are doing plays, but a whole bunch of other things have started to become popular, including opera, which at that moment, because a lot of the opera was somewhat comic, uh, was still thought of as somehow lesser. And then, uh, well, Commedia dell'arte, uh, and then uh, there were both some puppet performances and some performances where Punch, you know, who's also a puppet, would be played by an actor, as he seems to be here. Right. But this is, of course, a fantasy fi uh, scene in which Punch here, you know, the one with the hat and the big nose, obviously, and he, he's all, all about bodily protrusion in some way or other, because even the, the belly. And, right. and, and then this being Harlequin from Commedia, um, this might be a uh, Piero, although he's, it looks a little like uh, in images of Piero that just what he's wearing. Oh, on stage on right left. over there, yeah. Yeah, but the main figures here, and of course the legend is, it's a, it, I find this amusing for multiple reasons. Shakespeare, Rowe, Johnson now are quite undone. These are thy triumphs, thy exploits, oh, Lunn. Now Lunn was a, a John Rich, I think, who was sort of a theatrical performer, uh, uh, I think he did kind of comedia type things. But the point of this all is that someone is saying, okay, these paratheatrical uh, 
forms of entertainment, puppetry, comic opera, uh, commedia dell'arte, which often was sort of mimish, a, a mass theater, are driving out the real theater, Apollo, you know, right? right? From what, the stage. What does, what does Apollo represent there? I mean, like we think of Nietzsche talking about Apollo versus Dionysus is, is is the artist uh, uh, in, in this image, is Apollo representing the real, the good drama versus this yeah, low I, culture puppet stuff? Yeah, I think it, I don't think it's quite in the Nietzschean mode. I think it's just the simpler, him as the patron of, of theater. Well, okay. you could say Dionysius, but, but of, of art really, of high art, you might say. Uh, I think if you look carefully, I don't know if you can be seen on the screen that, Apollo is carrying, Hor it says Horus, I think, you know, oh, okay. the, the Roman poet. And then this is Harlequin Horus, which I think was a show that he had done. So, you know, a, a number of these, uh, this kind of theater did burlesques of, of like classical, like a tragedy turns into right. a silly burlesque. Um, and I find it doubly ironic, though, in a number of ways or multiply ironic. Well, first of all, it's, he may have thought this was true and maybe for one moment in terms of high society in London at this moment, maybe these other kinds of shows were more popular. But of course, more broadly, it's not true. I mean, Apollo did hold the stage, the legitimate stage continued to be, mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, uh, seen as the real thing. And the, the double tiny irony for me would be that the list of Shakespeare, Rowe and Johnson, I mean, how many today have you even heard of Rowe right. at the moment? Uh, John Rowe, I mean, I'm, I'd be hard pressed. I vaguely remember him. He's sort of for, a forgotten 18th century dramatist. So it's sort of ironic that two names that we do sort of remember Shakespeare, obviously, but a, a, a oddly misspelled Johnson, unless that means, you know, it can't be, it's not the right, it's Ben Johnson, clearly, but, you know, usually we spell him without the age. So the. So, the so that I'm just saying there's sort of irony that the, whoever did this is completely wrong, you know, about what uh, is really going to live. But the, the anxiety here is that good cultural drama is being driven, Apollo is being driven from the stage by these low Harlequin and Punch and, and, uh, uh, yeah. and the other committee character. But yeah, Deborah, Deborah right. Hunt, I'm sorry, the, Deborah Hunt, um, oh, uh -huh. from uh, who's originally from New Zealand, now in Puerto Rico, writes: "The people in this image all have exaggerated facial features. They look more like puppets than the puppets themselves, which is interesting." Yeah, in the, you mean in the one we're looking at now? I think right? so. Well, well, I mean, Punch so. is sort of, so to speak, a puppet. I mean, obviously, in some literal yeah. sense, that's a life-size person, and Punch was in theater uh, as an actor often. Uh, he probably would have worn a fake nose or something, but he usually, he always was shown as with very, very exaggerated nose and so forth, often a belly. Uh, um, but that is a good point. You, you could say that um, in a way. Uh, I, you we, know, I, yeah, please. Should we move on to the next yes, image, sure. Emily? who's backstage puppeteering the entire, oh, yeah. ha, this is the lush image. Oh, I think Deborah was saying that she'd actually been talking about the de the devil, uh, the one, the prior one. Okay, sorry, Deborah, apologies. This is an extraordinary image. I'm, I'm so glad you got it. It's in the book, but of course only um, black and white and rather small, it's a little quite hard to see. It's such a busy canvas. In the book, you know, I, I largely use this just as one, uh, notable piece of evidence of which there's a great deal more uh, for the sort of social position of the Punch and Judy show, uh, where it is, um, this is uh, 1846, so it, uh, as late as that, uh, it's clearly, uh, as we know was true earlier as well, or it might not have been Punch and Judy as such, but the puppetry was for adults. Uh, it was in the streets, no doubt children may have liked it too, but it was not a children's form, it was an adult form theater. And here we clearly see what Hayden, uh, we know, intended to represent as a kind of cross-section of society. So we seem to have very well-dressed people. Uh, this man in the center, I can only assume is a kind of country person, uh, clearly less. With the, the pipe? With the pipe. Uh, the little boy who I guess would be a street sweeper maybe has a, uh, and this odd uh, business over here, which you sort of have to look up, it's not very, 
obvious, but th this is apparently Haydn, um, uh, Hayden, I guess, really thought it was a May Day. Uh, right. So this would be a, a boy in blackface. I think it has to be blackface because he has blonde hair and he's very fancily dressed. This is some kind of dress up. There is a, a, a black uh, page on the coach here in the back, which is a kind of interesting thing. As I've thought about my book, you know, just in preparation for today, I thought, you know, I, there's not much about race uh, in the book and I didn't even comment on that, but it's, it's clearly here. I, you know, one thing I also, looking at it now that I think is very powerful is clearly the punch and Judy to the left are being echoed. Uh, you, we're being asked to compare them to the married couple. Uh, this is marked as sort of like a newly married uh, couple in a coach here. And you can see they're sort of each in a box uh, mm -hmm. as it were. And since punch and Judy are proverbial for, you know, uh, a bad marriage obviously kills, uh, kills Judy. Uh, I, think, I think that's gotta be intentional. And, and the weirdest thing, this little classical thing in the very center, I, don't, I can't quite read that image. I've looked and looked at it. Is that part of the, this is a hearse. And by the way, hearse, oh. like newlyweds and hearse. But is that little classical group, uh, is that part of the hearse? I guess it must be, but I can't figure out where those are in the The state. people in the top hats, you mean? Well, the, the, no. there's a little group of classical statuary, oh, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, I see. The, the country bumpkin with his pipe. And, and there's a girl right under it. I, it almost looks like it's her hat, and that, that, but that seems unlikely. I honestly can't quite figure out just what that image is in this space, but it too seems to be, we, we seem to be asked to compare the, the puppet to the left, the kind of classical statues, and then the real life couple to the right. I don't quite know what to do with that perhaps specifically, but that, that does seem to be held to our attention there. It seems like Hayden or Haydn, Hayden is trying, is saying the whole world wants to look at this puppet or the whole, all of London, high society, low society, military people, I think uh, a sailor and they, people in the getting married, people dying, everybody wants to look at Punch and Judy. Is that, why is the puppet so important? The puppet's so important here. Well, that's, you know, an interesting question, I suppose. It, I think, it, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that was both the artist's intention and that's what I was mostly using it as evidence for that, that, it, that uh, you know, all of society could, could be interested in it. I mean, puppetry, Punch and Judy in particular and puppetry in general seems to become uh, associated with uh, childhood in the Victorian era. Uh, that I have a page or two about that where it's, what seems to happen is that Punch kind of comes indoors so people start hiring the puppeteers to put on shows for a children's party, you know, in, indoors. And, and, and somehow it never quite uh, went away, I, I, I don't think. I, uh, that'd be an interesting question. I think there was always probably someone doing a real Punch and Judy show. Well, real, a traditional one outside. Mm -hmm. They still are now. They sort of brought them back a little like in, in uh, uh, well, I guess it was Covent sort of Garden. Seat. Pardon? I was going to say Covent Garden, but yeah, Covent Garden or the seaside resorts like Brighton. Right. Or, yeah. Well, my colleague Matthew Cohen taught a hand puppet class at the Puppet Arts Program at UConn this this past spring, and he had a an online uh, workshop with with one of the English punch perf perf professors. Um, so that that, in other words, that's still existing. Here's yeah. a. Here's a comment from Frank Proshin. He ah. says, but half the spectators, I'm not seeing the whole text, but half the spectators are looking away from Punch and Judy absorbed in their own stories. Professor Proshin points out. That I think that's absolutely right. It's an excellent point. I mean, uh, this couple in the center, it does look like that girl is looking at him with interest, although that must be, I take it that would be, a, there'd be a class divide there, although it's hard to be sure, but I think the woman is uh, uh, somewhat higher socially. Mm -hmm. But I think that's right. A lot of people are turning away. Mm -hmm. um, interesting, the coachman seems to be looking from far mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. on top of his coach, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly this young woman selling fruit is not interested. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a number of others are, Mm. He kind of turning back like this young woman looking away from the stage. And... Although it makes me think that it's 
it's kind of like a like the main event does seem to be in my mind the puppet show but maybe it's like you know you're at a football game and you're you're not paying attention because you're buying a hot dog or talking to the person next to you but it seems like the main event is that that show i don't know there's there's another comment question from uh, Sol Solmaz Tabrizi in Iran, big home of puppetry these days. Would you please explain about punch anarchy in popular culture? If, I don't know if you'd like to respond to that. Well, uh, I, 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 uh, I don't might be uh, understanding the question uh, correctly, but uh, certainly the, the Punch and Judy show as we know it, uh, as it is, say, at this moment, where the recognizable form of the sort of smaller, usually glove type puppets uh, uh, with the, clap, the sort of punch and his relationship to his wife at the center. But of course, there's these other um, uh, things as well. Um, uh, the, uh, you, you know, the, the famous puppet uh, script that survives with illustrations by Cruikshank, the one that's on the cover. Uh, now that, you know, there's a lot of debate. It's probably not a real show as performed, but probably a co compilation, but it essentially takes the form of, of Punch killing a series of people and killing his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an encounter with a policeman come to, to arrest him. He kills the policeman. He's sentenced to be hanged. He tricks the hangman into putting his own head in the noose and escapes. And then he kills the devil at the end. And if, you know, famously says the devil's dead. We can all do what we want now. Uh, so th th there's certain anarchistic, if, if you want to call it that, or uh, socially resistant. Uh, it seems to be right there at, at the letter of it. Uh, he's uh, you know, uh, th there is evidence that if, for some voices, punch could be seen as sort of a, a symbol of the, 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 br the brutishness of the poor, that he, he would have been read as sort of a poor man uh, mm -hmm. or lower class person. On the other hand, he's so, it's so fantastic. He wears that cap. I mean, it, it, it's so far from any, anything the least bit right. uh, realistic. Um, it, it clearly, uh, that had been how, uh, how punch emerges like in some of the there were shows sort of in the early 18th centuries that right now I'm not remembering the exact examples but where again punch would be an actor but he would almost always he would be in there like a, a kind of burlesque chorus he's not really in the play he's not part of the plot but he just makes fun of what's happening so uh, so he was always in a way uh, understood as right. this again transgressive uh, maybe would might be the way to uh, to put it, and even I, I guess I argue that he becomes that becomes appropriated, but even insofar as he becomes the title of, say, Punch Magazine, that's what they must have in mind. They mm -hmm. have in mind that they too will be a um, mm -hmm. cynical, skeptical voice, you know, uh, trans, you know, w willing to question anything like Punch had always been known uh, to be. Should we move on to the next image? Yeah. Okay. Oh boy, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, this one doesn't make much sense, you know, instantly out of context. Um, this was a chart that Oscar Schlemmer, legend, says, who was a figure in the Bauhaus. And, uh, you know, the Bauhaus is, of course, known for architecture primarily, but it was, uh, th they were interested in theater. There was Bauhaus theater, and he had done work with, with puppets of various kinds, he experimenting with uh, mechanized puppets, things like that. Um, and But this was just something he drew up, and... Uh, Puppets aren't even quite on it, um, except maybe sort of implicitly, but it really, it's a map of social uh, or cultural, I guess I should say, cultural hierarchy, I, I, because it's sort of hierarchical. It's not quite the absolutely sort of classic one, but religion uh, of some kind is at the top here. Right. So he seems, it's not quite hierarchical because theater's at the center and, and so is right. Shakespeare, you know? But but he does have a hierarchy of folk, the folk at the at the bottom, the so-called mm -hmm. folk or the so-called popular, you know, emerging in each case through kind of circus. It, you see how he's attempting to do it. It's, you could always question it, but it's quite fascinating and intriguing. Mm -hmm. We get to sort of commedia dell'arte, improvisation, comedy mm -hmm. boof or opera boof, uh, mm -hmm. and then finally high theater. But then somehow we go from that to religion in a way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, mm. I mean, the one thing, a oh, place. Uh, it, it's, I was thinking of the very first image we looked at of, of the hand of God and nature, mother nature and the human ape on, on the planet earth. And, and the way you've been talking about a very clear hierarchy, you know, or in the, the medieval image of the devil giving the witches puppets. Um, yeah. It seems to, I wonder if Schlemmer here, he's, he's just sort of laying out the map and not necessarily saying, well, this particular aspect of performance culture is much more important and better than the low form. Oh, that's but, right. That's that's right. I should have stipulated that this isn't yeah this isn't privileging them at mo uh, the higher, but he's saying nevertheless uh, that there is this spectrum. It's very intriguing. I, I think uh, looking at it today, I mentioned briefly earlier that, or maybe I haven't when we've been online, but I, I'm interested in stand up comedy as a form and right. this this the person column here to the left mm -hmm. could almost. Uh, appropriate that to stand-up comedy because it seems to right. me they clearly have some historical kinship to the fool the jester right. and then we get a kind of performer in the middle you can even almost think of the way in which in our literal society often stand-ups sort of graduate right. into being actors mm -hmm. uh, and then that you know they're not literally ever a priest but you could sort of say at a certain point stand-up is like preaching um, I think when you and I chatted, we may have mentioned uh, Dave Chappelle's very recent thing that he uh, released that was really not meant, not in any real sense funny. It mm. was a, a kind of sermon. I mean, I, I mean it as a compliment. I think it was quite right. a remarkable piece of work. I loved it. But, mm. you know, you can see it did start to approach the, pre the preaching. Um, and it was a kind of, a, this is on Netflix now, it's a kind of a scatological sermon, which is actually a feature of some medieval sermons because, I mean, he's telling all these off-color blue jokes, but then he's talking about the death of George Floyd and other Black folks murdered by police, which is, as you said, super intense. And he, it's outdoors and the audience is socially distanced. It's a very interesting context yeah yeah it, it seems to me like uh in this in this chart like looking on the right at music and third from the bottom is music hall song and jazz band and it reminds me that they were enamored of jazz bands in Bauhaus performance and you know there's all these photographs of of, of Bauhaus teachers and students in jazz bands together with Schlemmer's masks and puppets. And so yeah. there's this sort of fascination with carnival, low culture, and a lot of them were all Schlemmer and Kandinsky and uh, Paul Clay or Kandinsky and Schemler were at the same time designing for opera stages, making me think of the, the, the high culture stage. And that, excuse me for going on. And then with it also it's a time in the 30s in Germany's where I think they're not so religious so like so religious cult activity might is not necessarily oh we're all aspiring to that it's sort of I don't know where that sits yeah that's quite right oh um we actually I guess we could go on if, if you want since we got a glimpse of that or did with Miss Piggy oh, and yes yeah I was gonna say we could go on to that uh you know this was uh uh, the picture is not very clear. Uh, someone, someone is saying. Um, yeah, I don't quite know. It looks f fuzzy to me, and I don't know if Emily. Is this the? Are we talking about this one, the handsome one? Yeah. No, I think I'm looking at the Facebook feed. Oh, I see. It's, no, it's sort of out of focus, and I don't know why. And I don't know if Emily knows why that would be. Hmm. Do you know, Emily, why that might be fuzzy? We're not, we're not brilliant programmers here, or I'm not, so. Um, maybe we just have to continue with our brilliant words and hope okay. that the images might clarify. Yeah. Or say brilliant things about the nature of an image that's not in focus. Yeah. But this is an image of, of Jim Henson and Frank Oz manipulating Kermit and Miss Piggy and and of course, as as uh, as all uh, Henson style puppets do, the the puppeteers are are focused on the monitors. 
yeah, that was really what that was, um, the, what this was an illustration of that Muppet oh. in effect means media puppet. Um, I think you know, my reading of the Muppets at the end of the book is quite uh, negative in some ways. I, I just mean critical of, of them and their uh, effect that, you know, they, a lot of discourse about, about the Muppets is, was, was so positive. Uh, so extravagantly positive about not just that they were good performers, but that because this was a show for television, that they were they were doing this profound social work, saving the world. And I was maybe just a little skeptical about some of it, and especially about the way in which it was. I mean, even the, famously when when it was new, when Sesame Street was new, you know, this show is brought to you by the letter E. Well, yes, but you're also in a way. To, teaching them to, to accept commercials. I mean, it was a certain, um, uh, I, I, I quote some other people that have done work on kind of media, popular culture in the media, where it becomes a kind of super system. You know, Muppets are on the television, but you can also buy Muppet images, but, or, or, right. or little Muppet dolls, or you, and then, you know, it sort of becomes this whole, and, and the fact that their work was of course, uh, Kind of like the Simpsons later, you know, endless references to popular culture, you know, so all the time. Uh, uh, so I really, you know, I think when I read some of those pages now, I think, well, you're being awfully, uh, <laughs> you, you're being quite negative in some ways. Are you, have, you are you being critical of popular culture? Well, not so much of popular culture as I, I guess the criticism was of claims being made for popular culture uh -huh. or its uh -huh. redemptive qualities. And yeah. I think I was skeptical about that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, and then in, in a way, you know, the word popular in the title of my book is technically in quotation marks um, because right. really in a way the book suggests, I mean, I, if I have any ultimate claim that's a big claim, it would be that the popular doesn't really exist except sort of relationally so that there's no popular culture unless there's something the reverse of it. it. It's predicated on having something that one might say it has no simple name, but elite culture or high culture. Uh, so that's in a way sort of the argument of the book ultimately, I think. Uh, um, maybe we should go to the next image, yeah. which is a new image. And I wanted yeah. to mention, I because of the way that Facebook works, we all have different feeds. I think in some people's feeds, it's fuzzy as it was in mine, but in others, it's quite clear. So the vagaries of this particular technology we're using. And also um, in terms of labeling, I, I didn't realize that our friend um, uh, Pupak uh, Tabrizi, uh, Pupak Ardalan Tabrizi from uh, the University of Tehran, who's a good friend of ours is, is, uh, is taking part in this. So, um, and she had asked the question um, about uh, punch anarchy. So we appreciate Pupak being here, big, big honor that that the people that Pupak's taking part. So here, this image is not from your book, but you wanted to bring that in because it's a more recent image, and it's a, I, it's a, a so I think it's a life size, perhaps marionette of David Bowie, with another character in his hands. Right. I just I had thought of this because we were mostly talking about puppets, but. Um, uh, much more recently, um, my longtime collaborator, whose name is Scott Michelson, someone I've written with several times, uh, have been wanting to write something about David Bowie. And th this is this might not be familiar to most of you. It's a, a, a quite late uh, Bowie. This is from uh, his second to last album, The Next Day, which is something like 2011, I think. Um, and I, I can't really decipher this for you in any clear way, except it's a very arresting image. If you, I don't know if any of you know Bowie's career at all, but if you do, uh, the, the puppet is of one of his characters as, you know, Bowie used to take these characters like Ziggy Stardust, and this is clearly the thin white duke. I can just say that because he always wore a white shirt and a black uh, vest like that, and the thin white duke was, it, it's a very interesting image to, to return to today. Um, you know, it, it could be uh, Bowie kind of flirting with fascism, or as I think is probably more likely uh, thinking about it, but, but, but clearly the Thin White Duke was meant to be a kind of, kind of mid, you know, 30s, 40s-ish figure who may be Aryan. I mean, again, Bowie's symbols never are translatable clearly into it means this, but it's sort of this 
constellation of, of, uh, of associations. And I, Piero, who this is clearly Piero, however simple it is, uh, just a kind of doll image of it, but Piero had been one of Bowie's other characters uh, who he had often portrayed as a disheveled clown, quite interestingly, as if it was a clown the next morning with his makeup a little smeared. And that, uh, one of the things that interests me that I'd like, I haven't written about this yet, but I'd like to, is that the, the Piero image, and you know, it's all imbricated in some really, really uh, indirect way, but since Piero comes from Commedia and, and Punch ultimately descends from a Commedia character, they're sort of distantly connected to, to puppets. Um, but Piero had always been, first of all, the sad clown, and he gets appropriated in the 19th century by especially French poets and by kind of pessimism, by the philosophy of pessimism. So an image of Piero as d dying mm -hmm. or even dead, Piero appears to be dead here. It's, it's mm -hmm. kind of a pieta. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so th that I think, I think something's going on with what might be called a pessimistic view of, of, of the world that if Piero's dead was a kind of pessimistic image of you know the, that the world is 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 sort of not worth living in, as it were, that which is the sort of ultimate pessimistic thing. So right. you read the white makeup as as sick or dying, right. um, and then with the thin white duke, another kind of image of pessimism, because well, it just is if you if you read it, but you can kind of tell there are these Nietzschean echoes and stuff. But that if he's mourning, I mean, it's like double mourning. It's like death of death within death. So. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the Thin White Duke was someone who would return, right? It was always the return of the Thin White Duke. So I, I and that might not be very clear, but boy, what an arresting image. Right. And it seemed to be, you know, this doubling of the clown and <laughs> become the puppet and, and so forth. Uh, we, quite we have a, it's highly evocative. And I think I mentioned to you when we talked about this before that um, like, uh, David Bowie had worked with Lindsay Kemp, who was a very important mime and theater artist mm -hmm. in, in London, and who also was uh, interested in Commedia. So I always think that Lindsay Kemp had some sort of influence mm -hmm. on Bowie's theatricality. But Tim Milgas, another Yukon puppet arts graduate, who's now working out in LA, and so maybe he knows the, the deets, the details, he says, it's a rod puppet. I think he might be referring to the Thin White Duke puppet rather than mm -hmm. the Piero. Um, it's yeah. a rod puppet. It still exists in the creature shop in LA from a video that was never released. And then he adds, just so we can have some good dirt on it, uh, Bowie's wife, Iman, hated the video. So there's a backstory about that puppet that you might, we would never have known except that Tim Lagasse kindly shared this with us. Well, well, there is a video that you can see. It wow. might've been that it wasn't released at the time and now has been, you know, that happens all the time. So the, this image I think is in a video. I guess that's what uh, Timothy is, is talking about. I've seen it, you can get it on YouTube. Um, and it's, it's tied to a late song called Love is Lost. And it's a w very weird image in gen general. The, the video doesn't, uh, uh, oh, and, and he's saying that the Piero is a puppet as well. Right. Uh, you know, it, I, it was never clear to me if, if, it, if it was movable or not, because it usually just sits in his lap like this. I, th I think they might have been made for uh, a different song and never used, and somehow they kind of, you know, <laughs> used it for this one thing. But uh, I didn't know about the wife hating it. <laughs> so, who, who knew? Yeah. I wondered if their life size. Um, or if they're smaller than life size. It's hard to say, they must be large-ish. Yeah. Well, four different Bowies were built. Huh. Great, we're, I think we're getting some interesting information. Yeah. Should we move, is there another image that we wanted we're, to look at? I think we've gotten through our images, I think. Okay, I think we, uh, great, are. thank you, Emily, for sharing the images. That's, that's so great. Um, so, uh, they were both six feet tall. Uh, so that's oh. pretty life size, Tim says. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate yeah. that. I would have guessed that they were large, but again, it's always hard to tell. Uh, and that video has this other very bizarre image of Bowie's face that he, he well, it's in the long story, but he was using, working with this artist that blew hand, 
hand-blown TV screens. So oh, they really? distort the image in odd ways. Um, anyway. Fascinating. Um, oh, OK. Uh, hmm. There was a video artist who projected images on faces. Now I'm forgetting his name, but any, I, but I digress. Yeah. So that so that's some a look at some aspects of this um, of your puppets and popular culture book that that since you wrote it has such such an interesting effect uh, on on puppetry studies uh, in part just opening up people's eyes to the ways, as you said earlier, that puppetry functions in, um, or had, did function, has functioned in the writings and thought processes and hierarchies of, of different aspects of European society. And I kind of wanted to ask, what happens, you know, how has your approach to um, material culture and humanistic studies uh, persisted or morphed or been consistent or inconsistent in your work since Puppets and Popular Culture? Well, um, I think in some ways it might be easiest to talk about the, the most recent things because it's a little more obvious um, that certainly the, the little book I, I wrote called Bread, um, I have a copy of that, I say, um, I say little because it is physically uh, a lot, small book. Um, nice. uh, and it, it, it was a part of a series um, called, I, I guess, I think you were using this uh, as the title today as well, uh, Object Lessons. Uh, right. And that, so Object Lessons was a series where, uh, uh, it's edited by uh, Chris Schaeber, who was a former student of mine, and Ian Bogost, who uh, is quite well known, uh, among other things, uh, of, uh, writing about games and gaming. Hmm. Uh, but so their idea was, and it, I think it was inspired, but only in a rather loose way, by uh, the de developments in philosophy that have sometimes been called, you mentioned it, object-oriented ontology, sometimes ooh, three O's, or, or just simply object-oriented philosophy. Um, but not in any, uh, you know, really uh, overt way. And I don't think most of the books really necessarily, uh, you know, go into that. But, but that, I think just the idea that of small books, each devoted to an object. But, and then again, when we say object, their definition was, and this is interesting, extremely flexible. So that there's a book called Silence. Mm. Silence, an object, as we normally use the word, you know, perhaps not. But, and so it's really quite intriguing. Um, I instantly thought of bread, uh, not only because I do actually bake bread uh, as a hobby, but... Uh, and not just since COVID-19. No, I, I've done it for all along, although I do have, you know, my sourdough starter, uh, so forth in the fridge. Uh, but it had always been, uh, you can sort of tell even from the puppet book, you know, it is, as you meant, as you said, it's it's really more about text than it finally than it is about mm. theater, actual performing theater. Um, and I've always been interested in words. And I think some of the most intriguing stuff I still find intriguing that I discovered were these chains of words like, oh, one was the word Jack is, of course, just a name. In fact, my brother's name is Jack, but, but you know, it could mean uh, something like an automata, like, uh, like like those church figures that would be called a Jack. And then it starts to become uh, this word that gets used to, you know, like an electric Jack, like anything that uh, saves labor, a boot, a boot Jack. Um, and so you know, these chains of, of words are always really uh, interesting to me. and. Mm -hmm. In, in, in bread, I'd always sort of, you might say, I don't know, in the back of my mind collected, I had some notes once, never really did anything with them about the way bread is used as an image in mm -hmm. such interesting ways. Uh, wow. um, the staff of life, uh, uh, it has, of course, obvious religious overtones uh, in both in Judaism and Christianity, at least very prominently. Uh, and so that, you know, I, uh, one of the two editors who I knew, Chris, sort of said, maybe you'd like to submit something to that. And I mm -hmm. thought, and you know, bread just came to me. So it's both a physical object, obviously enough, mm -hmm. and yet well, sort of the focus of all of these metaphors and these, these elaborate systems of association. So in that sense, it's not, I mean, I almost 
it did once for like five minutes cross my mind, could I pitch an object lessons book on the puppet? I mean, it might well really be great. It's just that I felt, well, I'd, I'd already done that or it'd be too, too much similar to that. But, uh, but it's a very similar maneuver. I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in how like the place where you might say real objects sort of explode into uh, this kind of you know, constellation of meaning. Are you still thinking of objects in terms of hierarchies? Does bread does bread function in that kind of a hierarchical situation that you were talking about with with puppets in popular culture? Yeah, um, it, it actually does it, in an amazing way. I mean, you can, and it all it turns on color. Um, so going back through most of history, white bread is considered the best, and so you you get. I think I quote this. There's even in, I think it's in Horace. He was. Funny, he just came up in another very different context, but in the Roman port, uh, poet Horace, who talks about you, you, you have to know the color of your own bread. Mm. It's like knowing your place. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in France and historically, there were all these degrees of bread, you know, going down where, you know, really noble, noblemen get the very finest and then other rich right. people get pretty good bread, but a little lower and down to, you know, these mm. rough brown, brown breads and things. And then, you know, I'm not the only one to notice this. It's been written about by others, but this sort of ironic, even comic reversal sort of in the 20th century where people being, and even maybe today, guided by nutritional concerns, and now brown bread, whole wheat bread is, is the best. And white bread now is even sort of the expression, oh, that's so white bread, you know, it, it means kind of mainstream even a little lower class perhaps mm -hmm. uh, so you wonder know, bread yeah right. so the whole associational system just literally turns on its head so white bread becomes the bottom uh, of the class hierarchy so it it's really you know a name that uh i could mention here it certainly influenced my work in, in puppets in those days is bourdieu the french uh he's gone now but the sociologist who I mean, I think his greatest work was, a, you know, that big book called Distinction, where he really tries to analyze how all objects of every, objects and practices, really both, of, of, of every manner and kind, be, get class significance. They become signifiers of class and of a certain level of cultural attainment, maybe, things like that. I noticed that behind you is the Peter Schumann image of, uh, titled Courage with uh, uh, um, rye, rye, uh, rye coming out of a boot, a shoe, because yeah. he's a shoe, and, and he always, thinking of hierarchies of bread, for him, rough uh, Silesian or uh, style rye bread is much better than white bread. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a little politics of bread going on there, too. Well, I love that image. You know, that I'm sure you know there were there were four. I think I have the posters of, of his, where in each case the the grain is growing in one. Actually, it's sort of my favorite. It's growing out of a book. Mm. Um, I put that one up. I happened the, the bread and puppet theater, who I always loved. I, I I had had a chance to see them many years ago. You know, in Vermont, and mm -hmm. uh, went to one of the uh, circuses uh, quite a quite a while ago now, actually, but. Um, but I hadn't now living in California, I hadn't seen them for some time. Right. And uh, they, they they were playing just down the road from me in the in the middle of the country. Um, and I only found out about it sort of with hours to spare, but I was free and I went to see them. So I got to see them quite recently. I bought that poster there. Nice. Oh, that's actually a banner, isn't it? Uh, and I had to be honest, I think I think I may have told this to you. I put it in sort of a blank wall and I realized I was going to be doing this Zoom. I had to teach my classes this way. I actually right. put that there, you know, back when the spring quarter was beginning right. um, three months ago, it sort of felt like very dark times. And uh, right. that was kind of, I sort of deliberately did that as my little backdrop for right. uh, for, for teaching. But uh, and we, we all have to be aware of our, our backdrops and how we <laughs> present ourselves with Zoom. And we're, 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 we're catapulted into that world that the Muppet performance is involved with now. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, you were talking so interestingly about bread. Um, another recent, I don't know if you want to mention this, your recent book about H.P. Lovecraft and letters. And I always think of uh, Cthulhu, 
as a isn't that a um, Lovecraft yeah. monster? I always think like, well, that would probably be a mask or a puppet. But what what's what drew you to Lovecraft, and is in what ways might that be connected to a, a sense of of material uh, material culture? Yeah, you know that book was um, that book among other things. That's a collaborative book with uh, the man I just mentioned, Scott Michelson, who okay. was at Mich Michigan State, and it's literally in the form of letters between us. Uh, and we happen to both be named Scott, so it, every letter is just "Dear Scott" and "Signed Scott," um, which was sort of funny. So we could sort of I, I doubt that anyone who knew either of us at all would have trouble guessing which is which, but still it's not clear. Um, and I suppose just the notion of the letter, the, the epistle, uh, partly because I don't know if my audience knows this or even knows H.P. Lovecraft. He was a uh, writer of, I would actually say science fiction. He's often, it's often said to be either horror or fantasy or something like that. Nowadays, in fact, we also have the term weird fiction. He's sometimes uh, seen as the sort of first person to use that word or to think in those terms, or one of the first. But, but anyway, he wrote, um, he only wrote a small canon of stories and novellas, but he wrote, it's estimated as at least 100,000 letters. He was a sort of obsessive letter writer. Um, wow. uh, many of them are extant. I mean, some were lost, but a great many are extant and not, not all published, but there's, there's an old version of selected letters and there's a new one coming out that's even more complete. So there's that object of the, the letter itself, the physical letter. Mm -hmm. He also loved, um, well, the title is The Love of Ruins and the, the books are, the stories are pervaded by scenes of ruined cities. Mm -hmm. He was sort of fascinated by that. I might say even more broadly that um, uh, the, the, the story you were just alluding to, probably his most famous, I suppose, The Call of Cthulhu. Uh -huh. It's all about objects. It's literally, you know, it's, it's, it's like a detective story in that you might say nothing happens mm -hmm. in the story itself. Rather, things have happened and the story mm -hmm. is of their uh, recovery or their dis discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all like the, the narrator puts the story together with this sort of amazing bit of it's it's uh one of them is literally an object it's a it's a representation of what cthulhu looks like in clay done by a modern uh sculptor who saw it in his dreams oh. one of the great things about the story is that cthulhu speaks to sensitive people in their dreams including artists okay. and, and and you know if you there's a fan community of lovecraft as there is often right. people like that a kind of cult and so you can buy all kinds of fake versions of these objects that never ever existed they were just oh. in the story like you can go and buy a fake uh version of this little clay image of cthulhu complete with a little label that says this object is from the providence museum you know as if it was a real thing that it somehow oh, emerged cool. out of the story um, just as you you know Lovecraft famously mentions a book called the Necronomicon and it comes into it's been used in subsequent horror movies and so forth it doesn't exist it never existed there's one short passage from it given in one story and a few words from it given in other stories but it doesn't exist however google it and you will find a great many people who are trying to sell you a copy of it that has somehow been put together with Lovecraft stories or uh, so I, I find, you know, the way there were other th others like this, you know, Sherlock Holmes, other uh, well-known popular, you know, literary or fictional figures who, you know, like people write letters to his address, who, who somehow people insist on materially installing in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lovecraft's really one of those. Um, mm -hmm. There have been any number of attempts to tell us a, a horror story in which somehow Lovecraft is in it as a character. And uh, it's interesting. like that. I think of science fiction as a particular in, in science fiction films. It's a particularly rich area for puppets, masks, and performing objects. Because, like in Star Wars or uh, Lord of the Rings, I mean, you need that stuff to show these fantastic images. Yeah. But I wondered, like, this, and going back to to uh, trying to think about your work and its relation to material culture. So, are well, is that something you carry with you when you're thinking about um, love the the nature of the letter 
that Lovecraft's right as a, you know, an object. I'm thinking it's folded and put in an envelope and moves to the other person, or or the these ob this fascinating. It's almost like fan culture. The these sort of uh, Lovecraft images that that are created as is is the sense of material culture something that continues to inform your really analysis of of literature i i would say although bread's not literature this is that does that keep going with you yeah i i think i think that it does i mean again it material culture is a very capacious uh term of course right. uh, you know one might even in a sort of interesting philosophic sense say well is there any is it is, the, is that a tautology? Is there any other kind of culture? And of course, well, you would say um, books um, uh, seen as a text, uh, as opposed to physically, you know, ink on paper, it could be seen to be somehow immaterial, I guess. So there's, in that sense, right, of course, there are abstractions like justice and beauty that we would always have to acknowledge in some way. But, but, but in a certain sense, I mean, one of the insights of at least one strand of modern critical theory, here I'd be thinking of, Oh, you know, so there's sort of a famous development that comes out of Marxism and then Althusser, and then really be, maybe with Michel Foucault above all, um, where, uh, but what, what am I really, I, I'm sort of, I've kind of, kind of lost that thought a little bit, but uh, was it all, that, that ideology exists in material form? I guess that's really what I'm saying. So you could say that, understanding culture as, if not entirely material, nevertheless, that its material aspects uh, have a story to tell in their precise materiality, which might be called their, I don't know, their textuality or their texturality here I'm saying, um, or um, uh, like that. In other words, everything about them as, as material as matter has has some story to tell mm -hmm. and that even the division which again would be pertinent to you know, what I, everything i was talking about with puppets of animate and inanimate right. uh, does does that even somehow have we installed a certain subordination even in in that um uh and that i i i, I have some reservations about object-oriented thought but but the general idea of, again, it's part of a project of trying to escape a certain sort of anthropomorphism or anthrocentrism, right? That, that man is the measure of all things, which has always been sort of the hallmark of a certain kind of Western enlightenment philosophy from the Renaissance on. But that I, I, I think they're sort of trying to think beyond that. Um, and it can be, you know, quite, uh, you know, quite exciting. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I think we were chatting about this, that, you know, that, that Heidegger seems to be sort of both a certain kind of origin and that Heidegger talking about tools and tool being, I think they want to build on that. And at the same time, I think Heidegger drew an absolute line between the human and mm -hmm. the animal, certainly, and, and the non-human or the objective and inanimate. Um, that was, wasn't a really very focused answer, was it? it, it um, sounded well, um, if I could interrupt, like a, a second ago, the the way you were talking about the nature of the object, you you seem to be saying that the the object has this certain presence or integrity on its own terms, rather than being I don't know what a metaphor or, or a speaking for something else. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, ironically, I think my own work has tended to go to the metaphor. And in a sense, you could say my whole puppet book is more about the puppet metaphor. I mean, not literally only about metaphor, but it, it's almost more about the textual appropriation of, pu of puppets in right. various kinds of meanings. So in a way, my, but I do, I do think that object-oriented ontologies might be more of a yes there, that, that in other words, to only thinking of the object, the object somehow needs to be grasped uh, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, or, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes this just starts to go back to Kant to me almost, but uh, that in a way, I, I, it, it sort of seems to me that Kant, I guess he wouldn't do it for all objects, but at least for beautiful objects, that part of it is grasping them as, you know, that famous mysterious phrase, purposive, but uh, having a purposiveness without purpose so you know because we can't it's when we don't 
see any real purpose in them. It's not that we think I can pick that up and use it like a hammer. We're, then we would be denying it as beautiful. But it's when we precisely let something be, it, it, it seems to me, in and of itself and grasp it mm. as having its own purposiveness, which, however, I cannot state. Because mm. I, I, that's important. He always says that. It, and, and, you know, people famously, that's not unlike what Kant says about ethics, that, you know, the famous work that's gone into all of the tradition of human rights, that you must treat every other human being as an end in himself. Mm -hmm. never merely as a means to your ends. So in a way, his, uh, he feels the same way about certain kinds of objects. I guess, though, he would concede that, like, you know, a pizza, you know, a piece of food, uh, yeah, that is an, a means to our end, feeding, mm -hmm. getting filled up. Whereas I think, you know, like Ian Bogost himself, I think you know, one of the chapters in uh, his book, um, oh, God, his name's escaping me right now, his, his book on on object oriented thought, where he talks about cakes and stuff. And I think there's a really a kind of relishing of the object mm -hmm. in all of its details mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and how it, like in the bread book, I uh, talk a lot about because it's one of the most striking things about bread. It's always in process, mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of almost at every moment. Um, mm -hmm. It's dough, it's mm -hmm. bread, and then it begins to stale, you know, and so forth. But and that, I mean, what a kind of daily miracle that you have mm -hmm. just a pile of white dust, you know, white flour that mm -hmm. you could not eat. Mm -hmm. you know, it's virtually impossible to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have to almost use water to get it down. Mm -hmm. um, and in a, f a matter of hours, with a little mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. and not much else, becomes this solid mm -hmm. thing, this loaf. Uh, remark quite remarkable. An amazing transformation. I, now we're, we were, I think we're pretty close to the end of our fascinating talk with you, Scott, because it's 5.30 Eastern time. Okay. And um, that this, I feel like we've just begun a, an interesting conversation in so many ways. I wanted to say right at this moment it, um, to the folks watching, speaking of economics, if you want to, uh, the, the Ballard Institute is, is making our current programming free and accessible online, all these forums and also uh, twice weekly workshops. If you'd like to support this event and our other workshops, forums, performances, you can make a contribution. I think Emily, yeah, she's just posted that on, on the Facebook feed. So um, yeah, I guess like everybody else across the world and the country, we're looking at this sort of COVID economic situation. So that there was the spiel for, for support. Right. Um, well, I look forward I to hearing from Peter Schumann. I think he said he was yeah. there. I, I'd like to, just, that would be great. Yeah, that Peter Schumann is, will be the next uh, guest on our um, online puppet forum series uh, next Thursday, June 25th. And I wanted to mention some of the other online programming we've got going tomorrow um, in a different, more practice than theory, um, Elise Vanessa is gonna do a, a puppet workshop about toilet paper roll marionettes. We could talk about the theory of toilet paper rolls for a long time. And then next Tuesday, uh, Felicia Cooper, our talented graduate student, graduate assistant will be doing a cardboard party. And next Friday, the 26th, uh, Elise will be doing a workshop on trash monsters. So that's happening. Um, the, the Puppet Forum series will continue weekly on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Pardon me. And uh, we're really happy that uh, we're, people like Scott have been so generous with their time and their thoughts. I really appreciate that um, you've uh, taken your time to, to share with us some of the very interesting ideas. Well, it was great fun. I really enjoyed talking with you, John. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Great. Well, and I guess we'll say thank you and bye bye to our audience. Okay. Thank you, everybody, bye -bye. for being thank part you. of this. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, Emily Wicks. Emily Wicks.